Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. A young mother sold herself dearly for the sake of her son, agreeing to the chief's unusual proposal. And after a while, the employees were dying of envy. Long before these events, the outwardly prosperous life of the heroine gave a crack. Adriana was very happy. It had happened. She had just become the wife of the man she loved. The two of them with Michael came out of the registry office after the registration of marriage. Registration was ordinary, without witnesses, veils, and Mendelssohn's march. Solemn wedding ceremony Adriana did not want, as she did not like wedding height. And there were no more friends. All her friends married Photius, and in white wedding dresses, came to the registry office in a cordage of several decorated cars. Adriana had even been a witness at two such weddings in her early youth and had grown very tired of the noise of the clamor. She was an introvert, not interested in company, and she didn't drink alcohol at all. But at the wedding, she had to. And the morning after drinking Adriana felt disgusting. She had a headache, upset stomach, so she preferred simple food, lots of dancing, and going on a trip instead of all this marriage madness. Adriana's parents supported her every endeavor as long as their daughter was happy. They no longer hoped that she would get married, but still it happened. Out of boredom, she met a young man on the internet. They dated for over a year and decided to finally get married. Now Adriana was wearing a champagne-colored silk long dress with a beautiful neckline and sleeveless, sewn in the atelier of a dressmaker she knew. Her hairstyle her hairdresser had done beautifully since she had tried to intricately style her curls. Adriana had naturally dark curly hair, but the master so poured lacquer and twisted them that they stuck out like spirals. And after the gala, it was hard for Adriana to wash off so much lacquer, but she managed, though with difficulty. Adriana herself was a tall, dark-haired, dark-haired, brunette, not skinny, but not underweight either. Her hair was both a source of pride and agony. Pride because it was naturally clogged with flour, because styling it was quite difficult if you didn't pick the right product. And they also got married if the shampoo didn't work. Adriana and Michael walked out of the registry office, holding the marriage certificate, and headed to Adriana's car. Yes, yes, she drove Michael to the registry office by herself. In an old red Ford halo, Adriana was convinced that an independent woman herself makes her own destiny, and there is no need to wait for someone or something that favors you to help you help yourself. With this motto she, in general, and lived. Not far from the registry office, there was a photo studio where the newlyweds decided to look in and leave a memory of the significant day of their lives. A young girl photographer made them pose differently, and in the end they got ten good shots, with which Adriana and Michael were satisfied. After the photo shoot, the tired newlyweds went to a cafe where they had booked a table in advance. The waiter brought champagne and they started celebrating for us. Michael raised his glass and, smiling, looked at Adriana. To us, Adriana was happy. She would be married. And finally her colleagues at work would stop judging about her and match her with different bachelors. Let's go to Europe on our honeymoon. Remember I sent you the mega tour? Yes, very interesting tour program. Vienna, Paris, Prague, Dresden, Karlovy Vary. He'll tell you so much, but won't it be hard? The bus says there's no overnight travel. Somewhere in Europe overnight, and then from there we go to Prague one night in a hotel in Paris, and the rest in Prague. Well, let's go to this company tomorrow. I want to see the tour program in detail and talk about the price. Okay, then we will take the money and pay for the tour at once," answered Adriana. I bought a great camera. I'll take it with me. We should get some great pictures, something to look back on later," said Michael. I'm already looking forward to this trip. It's going to be great. The next day, Adriana and Michael went to the travel agency to book the trip. The manager showed them all the hotels they would be staying in and answered all their questions. Can you tell me, while traveling by bus, when will there be stops, sanitary stops? 
Every three o'clock at gas stations, you can buy something and go to the toilet. That's great. They have paid toilets in Europe, don't they? Yes, except in France, there are free public toilets. There will be a lunch stop in Poland. Thank you. We were getting worried about the long wait. The longest journey will be in the evening, but you'll be taken to a hotel where you can rest until morning and have breakfast. All right, let's book. Okay, said the manager. Now I'll fill out the contract and print it out. You carefully read and sign here and here. The girl started to fill out the contract on the computer. After 10 minutes, she printed out all the copies and let me sign. Adriana signed, handed over the money, and received a receipt for payment. The bus leaves at 5 o'clock. From the Drama Theater building, you will see three big tourist buses with the mega tour sign. Thank you. We have understood everything. Let's go to pack, said Adriana. Visas will be ready in three weeks, we will call you. We will wait for the call. Adriana gave the manager their passports. Packing was a pleasant experience. Comfortable shoes and clothes, suitcases and backpacks were bought. Dry rations were also stocked. Coffee and tea, they were told, would be on the bus. On the morning of the day of departure, a cab brought them to the drama theater. There they saw three large buses with green-blue stripes. Tourists with children and belongings were already crowding near the buses. All the cars had open luggage compartments, and the drivers were placing passengers' suitcases and bags there. The leader of their group was marking everyone who had arrived on their list. Adriana and Michael also approached her to have her check them in. Adriana was worried that they were gone and would have to go home with their belongings. That would be a shame. Are you Adriana? Yes. Your number two bus, seats 20 and 21. They're just about to put your luggage on the bus. You can go ahead and take your seats. Bring water and a snack and mugs in the cabin. In 300 hours, there'll be a stop. We'll have tea, coffee. Thank you. We'll get on the bus. Adriana took Michael's hand. Alex's guide will be on the bus with you. She should be arriving now, and I'll take the other bus. And Michael handed the suitcases to the bus driver under the sign too. They took backpacks and inflatable neck pillows with them in the cabin so they could sleep relatively comfortably. One by one, the buses were filled with passengers. The luggage compartments were closed and the convoy set off. Most of the way passed by big cities, often through woods and across fields. The first stop was at a gas station, almost near the border. All the passengers got off the buses to stretch their legs, go to the toilet, wash their hands and buy something to eat in the cafe. Michael and Adriana got off too. The parking lot was about half an hour. Having done their business, they decided to take a walk. Near the gas station there was a flower bed, in the center of which there was a jug, and flowers as if poured out of its wide neck. It looked very beautiful. Adriana photographed it as a memento of the trip. Michael didn't take any pictures of anything, just walked around and stretched his legs. The next stop was at the border with Poland. Their buses were first checked by border guards. They collected everyone's passports and returned them after some time with a stamp with the date of departure. Customs officers followed. They made everyone get out of the bus, went inside, and examined something. Having found nothing and having checked the documents of the group leader, the bus was let through. The cars went to the western border of Poland, where there was a transit hotel. It was already dark, and the passengers one by one fell asleep. Michael and Adriana got ready to sleep. They fell asleep quickly enough. The road was smooth. The engine was quiet, and in an hour everyone was asleep. We arrived at the hotel around 12 o'clock. Everyone was tired and sleepy. We checked in at the reception and dragged our suitcases to the room. The room was quite spacious but cool. Adriana was grateful to sleep in a bed where she could stretch her legs out which she did with pleasure. Michael took a long shower, and when he came out, Adriana was already asleep. In the morning, all the campers went out for breakfast, which consisted of scrambled croissants, toast, sausages, and coffee. We had 45 minutes for breakfast, 
and the bus had to move on. The last suitcases were loaded into the luggage compartment. The driver closed it, got behind the wheel, and the bus pulled onto the road. The next part of the journey was coming up. Prague it was 4 o'clock. All the tourists were excited about the magnificent views. The bus dropped them off at the Royal Gate. Here they were met by a local tour guide Betty. She had lived in Prague for 25 years and had been driving tours for the last few years. She gathered the whole group and led them into Prague Castle through the gate down a powerful alleyway. Street musicians sat on the sides, each playing something. People were throwing coins into cases and hats. The group walked down and stopped. What they saw shocked them. It was Street Fidus Cathedral, a tall majestic grey stone cathedral in the Gothic style. All the tourists took out their cameras and started taking pictures of the cathedral. Michael also took a few pictures from different angles. Adriana was delighted, but that was just the beginning of the tour. They followed Betty around for a long time. They each had an audio guide where they could clearly hear what she was telling them. Betty had a flag in her hand that she held up when she stopped. It was easy to find the group by it. It fell a little behind while taking pictures. We walked through Old Square, walked across Charles Bridge, and saw the Gunpowder Tower. My legs were buzzing, but I didn't want to stop. Then the whole group was taken to a transit hotel and told to reconvene at 400. Everyone was down by four, got on the bus, and drove again to Prague. Alex told them how to use the subway, what station to get off at. She said that the pass is valid for a certain time, and if you don't get there before that time, you can be fined. Took all the tourists to a money changer with a normal exchange rate, where they changed dollars into checked crowns. Crowns. Tourists were taught how to identify a road or cafe by the cost of a mug of beer or cup of coffee. Here it was called Gentlemen's. Adriana took Michael by the hand and dragged him down a small street to look for a suitable gospoda for dinner, not one of the houses. In the alleyway they saw steps, going down at a sign, by which we realized it was the Gentlemen's Cafe, went downstairs and got into a hall with a wooden floor, wooden tables and chairs. The ceiling was dome-shaped and high. A chandelier made up of beams and lamps hung overhead. Michael chose the vapor knee and icons on the menu, along with the famous Czech beer kozel. When the waiter brought them a huge roasted pork leg, which was fixed in a special device and stood on a tray on which there was a knife and a rosette with sauce, Michael took the knife and cut a chunk of meat from the leg. It was more tender than Isham, and there was something primal about cutting meat off a pig's leg. Smelling of the fire and the cave, they enjoyed the meal and fellowship. Michael, this is delicious. It's a knee-high boar. Adriana rolled his eyes in enjoyment. Yes, I really liked it too. We'll have another one tomorrow. Michael drank beer. The beers here are great. I liked the beer too. I liked all the food. And Prague. And we've only seen a little bit of it. There's another tour tomorrow. Betty said we won't walk so much. We'll drive. When are we going to Carlsbad? The day after tomorrow, Adriana answered. Then Vienna. Then Dresden. Wow. So we'll visit several countries. Yes, in Poland, Czech Republic, Austria, Germany and France answered the young wife. How exciting. I never dreamed of it. But the dreams came true. Michael was very impressed by the daytime views of Prague, its color. To get to the hotel, it was necessary to go a few stations on the Prague subway and the subway trains. The doors did not just open. At the stations, you had to push a button that was right there on the door. The carriages were very bright and there were free seats. Adriana immediately sat down on one of them to relieve some of the pressure on her legs. Our stop, Adriana. Michael touched her arm. Come on, I'm so sleepy. What time do we get up tomorrow? Seven. Tomorrow we leave for Karlovy Vary at 7.30. They went to the supermarket and bought some ham, cheese, and juice. They continued their meal in the room. There was a small refrigerator in the hallway where they could put the food. What we didn't eat, we put away there. Both of them were in a happy and playful mood. 
Adriana embraced Michael, began to kiss him, and they merged in a burst of passion on the bed in a transit hotel room somewhere on the outskirts of Prague. They both woke up only when the alarm clock rang. They jumped up quickly. Let's hurry up and start breakfast. I'll just brush my teeth and make up my mind. Adriana pulled on her jeans. She was wearing a semi-transparent blouse and jacket, jean scoop. I've already brushed. I'll even have time to shave. Yes, you and I are perfect campers, Adriana replied. The whole group was already eating breakfast. Michael poured both of them coffee from the coffee maker and brought ham, cheese, and toast. Many of the campers in their group had already eaten breakfast and were walking outside to the bus. Michael even snatched a sandwich as he walked. As he left, he still had time for a glass of juice. Adriana drank her coffee and wrapped the sandwich in a napkin and took it with her. Alex, their guide and group leader, smiled at them on the bus. She was a young, blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl. She had an easy character and was a good organizer. Everyone settled into their seats and the bus headed to Karlovy Ferry. It was not even two o'clock when they arrived. Carlsbad greeted them with a light rain. We had to go buy raincoats for the whole group. The old Chinese man, in whose small store the whole group bought raincoats, had probably made the day's revenue plan and was rubbing his hands together contentedly. Karlovy Ferry itself was astonishing in its appearance of the canal. Along the banks on the upland stood four, five, six-story smart hotels. There was even an old and scary-looking hotel from the Soviet times, where on the roof there was a pool with thermal water. Those who wished could swim in the pool. Michael and Adriana were happy to do so. It was very pleasant to dip in the hot water when it was only plus 15 outside. My mouth was steaming and my ears were cold. In the middle of Karlovy Vary, a river flowed in the stone banks, warm. Some hotels stood right on its banks, reminiscent of Venice. From Alex, they learned that Karlovy Vary is famous for its normal springs and drinking mineral water. Their twelve bustets with six springs were arranged in a large cloister. The springs are numbered and depending on the doctor's prescription, the patient drinks water from the spring under a certain number. There are a total of five such colonnades in the city. In a separate hall was the outlet of the hot spring. Periodically it burst to the surface with a large column surrounded by steam, and then the air around became moist and warm. All the tourists drank healing water from the Liberty Spring where water can be drunk by everyone. It was not in the colonnade, but in a freestanding whitewashed gazebo. Michael and Adriana found a cafe that Alex had recommended to them. It served a special wine, the taste of which could not be described in words. It was not like ordinary champagne, more like ordinary wine, but it was sparkling and with a light floral flavor. After the cafe, wet and happy tourists got on the bus. Adriana bought a rock crystal bracelet for her arm on the way, round sweet thin apples, waffles, and a bottle of interlocking. It's also called the 13th Spring in Carlsbad. The bracelet sparkled pleasantly and was a delight to behold. In the evening, we headed back to Prague. At a great time for walking, Prague was buzzing and interrupted by the lights of lanterns and agency glass storefronts. Tourists walked in groups and singly, a colorful cafe caught their eye along the way. They were tired of counting and noticing the sights. It was such an impression that they were put in a box with a painted beautiful city, with many beautiful squares, buildings, alleys, and embankments. Adriana couldn't believe what was happening, and just with her eyes wide open, absorbed the impressions. At the cafe, the Czech owner suggested they try some Levko soup with mushrooms. He brought a bottle of wine and glasses, for the second course, he advised to take coffee for the couple. The Czech brewed in a Turk, since, according to him, the coffee machine had died. In the corner of his cozy cafe stood a wooden chest, filled to the top with corks from wine bottles. I wondered how many bottles of wine must have been drunk to fill the chest. Michael and Adriana were falling more and more in love with this city. They had a trip to Dresden the next day, and Vienna the day after that. So after the cafe, they went to the supermarket again and bought a full bag of all sorts of skewers and, of course, 
wine. When they got to the room, they opened a bottle and sitting in the armchairs, saw off the past day with glasses in their hands. In the morning, they managed to get up before the alarm clock and quietly get ready. They went down to the restaurant. Even before all the members of the group arrived, they had a quiet breakfast and even had to wait outside for the bus for a while. Two o'clock to Dresden passed quickly. On the way, we stopped at a gas station where you had to pay one euro to enter the toilet, but then you could buy $75 worth of goods in the store. Adriana bought chili pepper chocolate. She had never tasted such an unusual kind of chocolate. In Dresden, they visited the Zemfira Opera, visited the Royal Palace Winger, in the ponds of which swam large colorful goldfish. Michael went from one place to another to capture everything better. Adriana just looked at everything, breathed deeply, and thanked the universe for this trip. She felt better than ever. They were led to a square where there was a church that had been raised to the ground and then completely rebuilt in 2005. There were flecks of the original stones in the masonry of the church, which the people of the town had carefully preserved and then brought to the construction. It looked touching and unusual dark stones in the middle of light-colored masonry. All the way back, they were browsing and sorting where bad photos were deleted. Adriana was taking photos in Wenger Park on the Brule Terrace. It was a sunny day, and one could pose for her husband. They went into a cafe. It was in a real castle with a luxurious interior. Inside, the walls were dark blue, framed by a white ceiling and white geometric pattern. A painting of a landscape hangs on the entire wall. From below, the walls are decorated with oak paneling. On the ceiling, crystal chandeliers hung in a row. All the furniture in the cafe was wooden. There were various incredible cakes on display, and Renee wanted to try them all. But the budget was tight. So she and Michael agreed to get different cakes and let each other try them. The cakes were brought to them with a cup of latte coffee each. It was interesting to sit and look at the interior the different paintings and molding on the walls and ceiling. Adriana took a piece of cake with such a creamy layer and orange jelly, and Michael took a cherry, chocolate one. They tasted each other's desserts. They were incredibly delicious with a nice combination of sweet and sour. And there was plenty of both, and I wanted to eat more and more. But good things, as they say, a little bit at a time. Adriana thought that saying was unfair there should be plenty of good things and a little of the bad. That would be much better for everyone. Nevertheless, the day was coming to an end and it was time to return to Prague. The next day, the buses whisked them away to Vienna. Along the way, they drove through Germany, marveling at the neat buildings and manicured lawns with counselors. And when the road went through Bavaria, they didn't have time to ooing and awing. It seemed that from behind the trees would pop out elves or fairies. So fairy-like was the scenery. They were driving along a mountain road, and neat red roofs of houses could be seen below. The forest around them was very beautiful and mysterious. Michael, look, there is a village or a small town in the distance. I see all the roofs are red, and there's a forest all around, and they have a river running in the distance. It's a very beautiful place. Vienna was met with rain and gloomy skies. Street Stephen's Cathedral stood out with its Gothic arrows in the center of the old part of town. We won't get a picture today. Do you think it's so gloomy? There's no light to match. I'm taking pictures as I go. We can't leave without pictures. We're going to Viborg. There's a butterfly museum there. Maybe there's good lighting there. We arrived at the winter residence of the Austrian Habsburgs. Holbrook, it was a large castle with various sculptures and a large park. It takes up a whole neighborhood in the center of Vienna, said Alex, who loved the complex. There are up to 30 individual sites to see. I don't know if we have time for all of them. Let's at least see most of it. See, we'll try to keep up. Michael's got his camera at the ready. Michael, we've already filled two memory cards with photos, but we still don't have enough. Adriana said. They passed through the famous Swiss gate. 
This was the name of a beautiful red and gray arch with a royal coat of arms on top and golden inscriptions in Latin. In Viborg, there is the National Austrian Library. There is also a museum of Sisi, so-called Elizabeth, the Bulgarian wife of Emperor Franz Joseph I. Her life was full of tragic events, and it is worth a separate story. However, you can easily find it all on the internet. Separate apartments were provided for each member of the imperial family. Today, some of these rooms are closed. They are used as offices of statesmen, and some of them have been turned into museums. They walked through several rooms, including the audience hall where Emperor Franz Joseph received visitors. The walls and furniture in the room were red with gold, the doors white with gold. The interior of the room was decorated in the Rococo style. Very light, graceful, moderate, but at the same time rich, emphasizes the officiousness of the meetings and the graciousness of the Emperor Alex. Fun, and yet detailed about each room in the palace. Aren't you tired yet? Tired. The tourists howled in unison. Then let's get out slowly. Further, there are insignificant rooms with similar interior. Downstairs, the Butterfly Museum awaits us. There's a separate entrance fee. They went down a marble staircase. Take my camera and I'll walk around here. Michael handed Adriana his camera and sat down on a bench near the palace. Adriana went inside the Butterfly Museum. It was very hot and humid inside. The lens was instantly wanting. I had to listen to it with a special cloth. Big beautiful butterflies flew down for treats spread out on a plate slices of banana and apples. Separately, there was a glass cabinet where cocoons, in which future butterflies matured, hung on wooden sticks. Adriana searched among the leaves of tropical plants for mating beauties. She saw monstrosities on a leaf from a cool wallet with blue and pink eyes painted on its wings. She managed to get a picture of it before it flew away. The further excursion was by bus. They were driven around to a fault and told about the sights. In the square they saw standing facts. The horses were beautiful and well-groomed. There are about 150 acres in Vienna, and a third of the coachmen are ladies. Alex smiled and winked. Each cabman has either a green or red card. The green one gives you the right to drive out on even-numbered days, and the red one on odd-numbered days. This is how the authorities solve the problem of finding a parking space. Not everyone, of course, is happy with it. What can you do? What beautiful horses? Michael, take a picture. I'll try. It's not very good in motion. We're going to stop now, and we can take pictures of the facts and with the facts. Alex smiled again. Let us wait. All the tourists spilled out into the square and scattered each to the fact that they liked the most. The horses were white knits and crows and apples. Each had a different design on the horse's eyes. When the horses were resting, the cabmen would cover them to the fullest. Adriana loved horses very much. Since she was a child, she watched movies about them and approached the horses that grazed in the village. Adriana's grandmother was a stable boy at one time. Apparently, that's where this love comes from. In Adriana's mind, a horse was the most intelligent and loyal animal. The bus arrived in Prague late in the evening. We didn't go to the supermarket. We decided to finish what was in the fridge. There was a raw half bottle of wine. We drank the wine and cheese, went to bed, and 10 minutes later slept like a dead man. Both were overwhelmed with impressions. Their group was to go to Paris for the weekend. The bus of another carrier was leaving from the bus station in Karlovy Vary. They were to take the subway to the bus station in Prague and from there to Karlovy Vary. They had to check out of the hotel at 2 o'clock. The day was spent packing and going to the singing fountain in the center of Prague. The performance was very impressive and stirred the senses to classical and contemporary music. In the air sighed powerful jets of water, which danced, became small, then again big, jumped out one by one and to the beat of the music. All this illuminated by multicolored spotlights was very spectacular. You know, we've been here only five days, and it seems to me that half of my life has passed. 
so many impressions. Adriana was packing her suitcase, checking to see if she had forgotten anything. There are hundreds of photos alone. Look, you look so disgruntled. Who spoiled your mood? It wasn't me. Asked my husband. Maybe it's who knows. It was windy and my hair was in my eyes. I don't like it so much. That's why I was bracing myself. I guess. Why don't you look at your picture? Do you look like Mr. Bean on a walk? Oh, yes. Mr. Bean, Mrs. Bean. Would you care to explain what you mean by that? Said Michael. You've got a look on your face like you've swallowed a hat without salt. Well, I didn't swallow it. All right, I'll watch my face. My suitcase and backpack are ready. Will you put the razor and deodorant away tomorrow? I'm gonna shave. Sorry, I wasn't thinking. It's not like you shave every day. Every day. It's an all-night drive, and I don't know when I'll be able to do it. I don't want to scare the French women with my appearance. Michael, pleased with his joke, grinned. Adriana pretended that she had heard it more than once and continued to tuck in her clothes. Soon she was done. There was still time to get a good night's sleep. Tomorrow they had a long drive to the bus station, and then to Carlevy Vary. They got there without adventure. The bus driver had a doggy on the dashboard who shook his head at the bumps and potholes. It was fun to watch her. In Carlsbad, they stepped onto the platform and saw a large tourist bus with tinted windows. It would take them to Paris. This bus was much more comfortable than the one that was taking them to Prague. Everyone settled into their seats. The guide came in and said hello. Hello, my name is Kathy. I live in Germany and accompanying sometimes such buses on the road. I will tell you about the sights of Paris and the rules of the tour and your behavior. During the trip, you will be offered coffee or tea and also in Germany grilled Bavarian sausages. There is a restroom on the bus, but I don't recommend using it. It is for emergencies. We will be stopping at a sanitary stop, gas stations, every three, four o'clock approximately. Any questions? Ah, uh, yes. When and how much for the sausages? Five o'clock. One sausage, two euros. Wow. Europe. The bus started and Adriana dozed off in anticipation of seeing Paris. After four o'clock, the bus stopped in the parking lot. The drivers got out, pulled out a brazier, and started grilling sausages. There were quite a few people who wanted a hot meal. Will you have some? Michael looked enviously at the lucky ones who were gnawing on the coveted sausages, standing by the brazier. I'm not. But you go. Adriana realized that the man must be fed, otherwise he would be angry and irritable. Then I'll go. In the meantime, get some coffee. They sat just outside the coffee machine. Adriana took the crumbs and pressed the button twice. She sat down and waited for Michael. He came in satisfied, bought, and ate two large sausages. His stomach was jubilant. Germans are good at fried sausage. While there was a break, Adriana and Michael had time to drink their coffee and stretch their legs. The next restroom will be in France, and it's free. The stop will be at 500 hours. I'd like everyone to go out and get cleaned up. Paris loves the neat. The Cathy guide said this with a smile, looking around at all the passengers. Everyone sat down in their seats and drank tea and coffee. The drivers put away the brazier. Sitting back in her seat, the bus moved off. Paris was getting closer and closer. Five o'clock the bus stopped, as promised, at the free toilet. All the women got out and started washing their faces, combing their hair, applying mascara to their eyelashes as if they were getting ready to go on a date. And not in vain. What they saw at six o'clock when they entered Paris struck their hearts forever. Paris was deserted in the morning. The French liked to sleep in, but this was a plus as the bus was able to drive unobstructed through all the streets. Passengers swiveled their heads left and right, seated to consider everything the best they could. They passed a building with lighted cans, windows of beautifully decorated stores. The Eiffel Tower and palaces could be seen in the distance. Paris was magnificent. On the bus sightseeing tour, they got an overview of the city, saw the main sights. They drove through Paris, 
got out and walked through the Latin Quarter, saw the Moulin Rouge and the White Cathedral. With Rocker, they walked around Montmartre, climbed the Montparnasse skyscraper, and looked down on Paris from the 60th floor observation deck. The view was amazing. Then they were taken to Cité Island and the Cathedral of Our Lady of Paris. Inside the cathedral was very majestic and dark. I didn't want to be in it for long. There was a small cafe on the square where our newlyweds headed. Michael and Adriana were able to grab a snack and coffee overlooking the cathedral. There was also a large public restroom underground. Each stall had a wash basin, which was very convenient. My hands were dirty, and it didn't hurt to wash my hands. How nice to wash your hands in the center of Paris, Adriana said. I hadn't really thought about it, but I did, and it made me laugh. Adriana laughed. I feel like Esmeralda. You know, it was hard for her to be medieval. Paris was still like that. I don't know, Michael replied. I didn't live in medieval Paris. Medieval Moors are worse. Michael took a picture of Adriana. The picture came out great. The sun was setting. It was golden hour. This photo they later printed out and put in a frame. Then they were promised to be dropped off near the home for the handicapped for a walking tour of the home for the handicapped. The central attraction was the tomb of Emperor Napoleon. The tombstone was made of red-brown marble and close to the body. The tomb was made of Karelian Porfirio. It was specially installed below the floor level so that anyone who wants to read the inscriptions would bow their head, saluting the late emperor. The House of Invalids is one of the hallmarks of Paris. Here even today live pensioners and veterans who have devoted themselves to the service of the motherland. Our next destination is the Rodden Museum. Follow me, don't be defensive. The group followed the guide. The tourists scattered around the museum looking at the sculptures. Creations made of bronze and marble were displayed in various halls of sculptures of different sizes from small fragments to entire compositions. Rodin's talent was evident in everything. How subtly he depicted the expression on faces, with what precision the hands and hair were executed. Adriana loved the sensuality of the sculptural composition Eternal Spring. And of course, the thinker. Many of the sculptures were unfamiliar to her. Some caused a storm of feelings, some embarrassment, and some pain. All in all, there was a lot of impressions. Michael scrutinized and photographed Rodin's works. In the courtyard, their attention was attracted by a sculpture of Balzac, Oni, said the guide. In the evening, they were released to walk along the Champs Elysees. It's a very long street. First, Adriana and Michael climbed the Arc de Triomphe. From there, they had an excellent view of the Champs Elysees and part of Paris. Real estate prices are very high here. There are barely six people in all of Paris who live here permanently. But here you can rent an office for two o'clock to meet important guests or rent a mailbox for only 100 euros. Kathy talked about the peculiarities of the street. I see stores and crowds of people. Adriana was taking pictures of the views. Adriana. Let's take a picture of the view of the Arc de Triomphe from here, said Michael. Oh, you found a gorgeous view. Here we go. Late that night, they were brought to the Manhattan Hotel. The couple was very tired. On the way, they stopped at a local convenience store. Adriana had learned French at school and understood almost all the words and even started to speak. At the store, they bought Normandy Camembert, natural yogurt, and a bottle of orange juice. The clerk suggested they choose a bottle of wine. Michael chose the Prosecco. He had wanted to try it for a long time. Adriana was fine with it. The wine was not strong. Having a glass before going to bed was fine. We haven't had wine in Paris yet. Michael was in a wonderful mood. We'll remember this evening. We will remember our trip with you in the long winter evenings. Adriana was nestled in a chair with her legs tucked up and the weather is not hot, just right for hiking. Only in this part of Paris, I wouldn't want to walk at night. Kathy warned that Paris is divided into neighborhoods, and there are some where it is better not to walk at night. It's best not to push your luck. In the old part of Paris, there were quite a few Afro-descendants on the streets. 
They cleaned the streets or sold souvenir keychains with the Eiffel Tower in miniature. At night, Adriana and Michael made long and passionate love. Paris. The magnetism was working. Adriana felt very whole and easily felt her femininity, her sexuality. She wanted Michael. He wanted her. What else do young people need to be happy? In the morning. At nine o'clock, they had to go on an excursion to Versailles, and after lunch, the Louvre was waiting for them. A boat ride and dinner. They woke up without an alarm clock at seven o'clock and began to take their time getting ready. They had to find the cafe where they were to have breakfast. It was on another floor, but which one did they forget? They had to look in the cheat sheet, thoughtfully made by Kathy. Aha, a floor. Adriana went first. Michael refused to go, citing a stomach ache. Adriana didn't wait for him and found the cafe herself. She got herself an omelet, croissants, coffee. Paris was visible from the window. The sky was in a milky haze. There was no sun. Adriana felt an incredible burst of energy and happiness from the fact that she was now on the eighth floor of a hotel in Paris, drinking coffee and croissants and looking at the city. When she returned to the room, Michael was already dressed. They took the elevator downstairs together and walked out into the parking lot to their tour bus. Kathy had provided his number the day before, and for good reason. There were almost three identical buses in the parking lot. They were almost two o'clock on their way. They passed the Bologna Forest, where they saw large rabbits grazing peacefully on the slopes. They were melancholically chewing grass and moving their ears amusingly. The bus pulled up to Versailles and stopped in a parking lot near other tour buses. They were given four o'clock to visit Versailles and were given audio guides so they could learn more about the sites. Palace of Versailles. The group entered through the large golden gate. The palace courtyard was filled with modern installations by artists. One depicted rusty arcs made of curved strips of metal by French conceptualist Bernard Vinet. Do you think we'll get to see anything at Versailles in 400 hours? I think there's something. Remembering previous excursions, I realized that I had to go to Paris for at least a week to see at least one third of the sites. Opening the lens, Michael replied, anticipating a lot of interesting things. Wow, and here you get a whole hell of a lot of rooms. But it's terribly uncomfortable. Imagine, you're sleeping. Suddenly, the door opens and the courtiers march through your room. Maybe the king himself. Wouldn't I like to live in that time? They walked and walked through the Palace of Versailles. Each successive room was different from the previous ones. They were decorated differently with different furniture and lamps, different tables and carpets. There were many sculptures, post-drapery-like frescoes. In one of the rooms, they were struck by a magnificent royal throne, decorated with feathers, gilding and fringed draperies with embroidered floral motifs suspended high from the ceiling. From the windows, they could see the huge, beautiful garden of Versailles with its fountains and shapely carved lawns. Due to time constraints, Michael and Adriana didn't have time to walk around the garden. They could only admire it from the windows. Michael went on ahead, leaving Adriana to look at and photograph what she wanted. It was already time to get back on the bus. Kathy's guide had warned that those who were behind would be taking a cab to Paris, so she really didn't want to miss the bus. Sneaking between the tourists, going around them from different directions, she approached the exit. At that moment, two French women were hanging out in front of her, right in the doorway. Adriana tried in French to ask them to move away, but it was as if they didn't hear her. I had to go right at them and literally push them out of the way. Outside the door immediately were steps of light marble that merged into one. Adriana didn't notice and stepped wide. Just then, sitting down on the foot that had returned, she took care of her camera. The leg hurt badly. When she tried to stand up, she was able to do so with great difficulty. Wings very slowly, she found her way to the bus. Her leg was tearing with pain. Stepping on it was possible. Adriana entered the bus and immediately asked the driver for a bottle of water from the refrigerator, sat down, and applied it to her sore leg. The pain subsided. The bus pulled away from Versailles, 
and headed towards the louver. They got almost to the louver, but the street was blocked off due to a bicycle race and the Tour de France. There was a large crowd of people, and there was a carnival procession of cars with platforms on which girls in colorful costumes were dancing. Everyone was cheering and shouting. The bus came as close as possible to the scene, and we had to walk across the bridge to the Louvre. Adriana heroically overcame this distance. There was more than enough to see in the Louvre for more than one day. Kathy suggested not to look at every painting or sculpture for a long time, but to find the most favorite one and stand near it. So we did that. But I really wanted to see the image of Mona Lisa hanging on the second floor. There was a long and wide marble staircase leading to the picture, and Adriana went up sideways, as it was very painful for her to go straight. After climbing the stairs, they entered the crowded hall and immediately found the Mona Lisa. A group of Japanese were standing near her, busily photographing a small painting placed behind armored glass. The glass gave glare, and the pictures were not quite good. Adriana experienced great disappointment. It was like Rembrandt's Madonna in the Dresden Art Gallery. There you could sit in front of it and look at it as long as you wanted. But here you could neither approach it, nor look at it, nor take a photo. The bus was finally able to pull in, which was a great relief. Adriana couldn't think of anything else like the pain in her leg. With great difficulty stopping, she walked down from the second floor and reached the exit. There was still a bus to catch. Michael supported her under his elbow. They got to the bus with no luck. Already in the car, it was much easier. The water in the bottle was still cold. They arrived at the ship where the promised dinner was to be held. Adriana didn't know how best to turn her leg so it wouldn't hurt, and she wished more than anything that she were in a hotel room. Instead, she was going to spend 10 o'clock on the bus, then 3 o'clock at the bus station in Karlovy Ferry, then an hour on the bus to Prague, then on the subway. She tried not to think about it and concentrate on Paris. The banks of the Seine were littered with stone. Somewhere there were platforms on one platform. On the opposite bank there were figures made of sand. On another platform there was music playing and couples dancing. It looked very beautiful. The French knew how to relax. We left Paris late in the evening, filled with the charm of this big city. The bus drove non-stop all night and brought them to the bus station in Karlovy Ferry. This time it was sunny, and on such a day, Carlsbad looked festive and majestic. It was three o'clock before the bus to Prague. They wandered around the streets, drank water from a spring, got hungry, they went to a cafe not far from the bus station. There were only two tables in the cafe, but very tasty coffee and cakes. The bus going to Prague came with the same driver who was taking them here. The doggy was still shaking his head at every hub. When they got to the hotel in Prague, they went straight up to the room as they were tired. Michael later went out to the supermarket to buy food for dinner. They had dinner sometimes in the hotel room. Adriana's leg had turned dark red with a blue color. She instinctively lifted her leg up and placed it on the wall near the bed. That's the kind of leg you have. We have to contact the insurance company and go to the hospital. Michael came in from the store and was horrified. How badly does it hurt? It hurts and aching and swollen. Adriana answered her. The next day, the young woman called from reception to the phone number on her insurance policy. She was directed to a huge hospital complex on the outskirts of Prague. She had to take a cab. At the wheel was a young woman with a fashionable asymmetrical haircut. She drove them to the gate and wished them well. After struggling to get up to the second floor, they found themselves in a hospital corridor. They were called to see a doctor. The doctor examined the leg and referred Adriana for x-rays. The x-ray machine was in the next room. The pictures were immediately downloaded into the computer. After the x-ray, we had to wait for the doctor to come out and invited her to come in. There was no fracture, but there was a severe dislocation, sprained ligaments. In the office, at the doctor's request, the nurse put a special pain-relieving bandage ointment on Adriana's leg with an elastic bandage. The tube was given to Adriana to take with her. 
Here it was also suggested to buy crutches. The doctor adjusted the crutches to Adriana's height. He prescribed cold on the leg to keep on top of bandages and to lubricate with ointment. They bought the ointment at a neighborhood pharmacy. Walking was much easier. From the hospital, too, they had to take a cab. When they arrived at the hotel, Adriana immediately lay down on the bed and put her legs up. It was easier for her that way, and her foot didn't drain as much. The shoes were comfortable with adjustable buckles, so there was no difficulty. According to the tour program, the group had several excursions to do in Prague. How am I going to do the tours on crutches? Adriana lamented. If it hurts too much, we won't go anywhere. Michael put his arm around Adriana's waist and pulled her close to him. I think I can handle it. I won't miss any excursions. I'll be flying on crutches ahead of the group. Adriana laughed as she pictured the scene. In the morning, they woke up before the alarm clock and had no problem getting ready and going out for breakfast. Some of the group had not gone on a tour, but had gone wandering around Prague on their own. It was not the first time they had been here. This time, they would take the subway to Wenceslas Square, and from there, the bus would take them to the zoo. Michael and Adriana bought passes from a machine near the subway station. They went downstairs and 20 minutes later, they were on Wenceslas Square. There was no bus yet, and tourists were sitting on benches in the square near the monument to Street Wenceslas. Behind the monument was the National Museum. The bus pulled up, and Michael and Adriana took their seats. The Prague Zoo covers an area of 58 hectares. There are 12 unique pavilions and more than 150 expositions. In total, there are more than 4.5 thousand animals in the zoo. They belong to 650 species. Alex was telling the tourists about the upcoming tour. The zoo was really gorgeous. There was a flock of pink flamingos on the lake. It seemed like a pink cloud had descended there. Elephants were walking freely, sprinkling themselves with sand in the large aviary. Hippos swam in a pond. There was a separate pet exhibit next to the crocodiles. Adriana saw for the first time a cow with the colors of the prince's house. There were various pet sheep, horses, geese, chickens, ducks, turkeys. Ostriches were located separately. There was plenty of room for all the animals. Mountain goats climbed up natural mountains and watched the visitors from above. Giraffes grazed in a large area. Adriana and Michael really enjoyed watching the animals and taking pictures. You could catch many interesting moments from their lives. Let me take a picture of you in front of the elephants. Come on, and one more elephant for them is not superfluous. She appreciated your joke. You're no elephant. They went home. When they got home, Adriana didn't go straight to her parents, but stayed with Michael in their apartment for a while. She didn't want to upset mom and dad. She didn't tell them anything on the phone, but she had to give them the souvenirs and tell them about the trip. After a week, Adriana pulled herself together. Her leg was almost painless, but she continued to rebel it and walked on crutches. Mom asked daughter, what happened? A fracture, mom. No fracture, just a sprain, a sprain. And somewhere she managed to move her leg. At Versailles, mom. Nowhere else. Adriana laughed. I have to, but there's nowhere else to expose it. Mom, I brought you and dad a bottle of balsam and some sweet chocolates and wafers. Oh, thank you. Come and have tea with us. Come on. They drank tea. Adriana told about her two-week trip, talked about the peculiarities of different countries, their customs and habits of the inhabitants. Mom and dad listened attentively and looked at the pictures. They liked everything very much. They were happy for their daughter. The usual everyday life began, but there were so many impressions that they were enough for six months and even more. Adriana worked as an accountant in a small manufacturing firm. There was a lot of monotonous work. She managed several sites and often came home late. Michael worked as a programmer at home, often traveling on business trips. Adriana prepared food for tomorrow in the evenings, left Michael, and took it with her. Week after week went by. On a sunny August day, Adriana realized 
that she was expecting a child. She was very happy and decided to share her joy with Michael immediately. He was on a business trip and would be arriving soon. She wrote him a message, you have a surprise at home. A reply came right away. What's the surprise? You want to tell me? I'm intrigued. She replied, if you do, it won't be a surprise. I'm flying in tomorrow night. I am very curious to see what you have in store for me. Michael wrote back. In the morning, Adriana got up and didn't drink coffee. She didn't feel like it. She squeezed the juice out of an orange, drank it, made oatmeal. I took a boiled chicken fillet and a cabbage salad to work. I didn't feel like eating and was nauseous. Cabbage with lemon juice. It was the only thing I ate well. In the evening, Adriana tried not to be late and get home in time to prepare dinner. Michael's airplane was already in the air. Soon Michael walked into the house, set down his bag and package, and undressed. Adriana walked over and gave him a hug. So what's your surprise? It will wait. The surprise first. Okay. Michael washed his hands, sat down at the table, and eagerly began to eat. I've been pregnant for nine weeks. That's news. That means I'm going to be a dad. Michael got up and kissed Adriana. When are you due? March. If it's good, it'll be good. Trust me. There's no reason for it to be bad. Will it be a boy or a girl? It's too early to tell. You can usually tell at 15 weeks. I'm going to the doctor tomorrow for an ultrasound. I can go with you tomorrow from 6, Michael suggested. Not yet. I'd like you to be at the ultrasound when they look at the sex. Until then, our baby looks like an egg. I don't know anything about it, but I promise you I'll figure it out. Let me read up on embryo development. One of Michael's good habits was to be thorough in matters he didn't understand. He would read sources, think, draw diagrams. We'll see soon enough. I don't want to eat anything empathetic, but you have to eat. Don't do that. He doesn't want to eat. You have to find something you like and eat it little by little small portions, said the husband. I'll try it. This is a new condition for me. I don't know what to expect. I wonder if it will be a boy or a girl, said Michael. I'd like a girl, but I'd like a boy too. All right. Aha, uh -huh. it's a deal. You take it to the hospital and you'll be a real father. Of course, I'll be the best father in the world. They were already lying in bed and discussing the future together with the child, not knowing yet what surprise fate was preparing for them. In January, Adriana went on maternity leave. Her belly was already clearly visible. She bought maternity clothes, special pants with a wide waistband, and a hoodie. On her feet, she had to buy soft suede boots without a lock because her feet were cut off. Adriana went to the doctor for another appointment. Adriana, do you have a bad urine sample? Any back pain? No, you need to see a urologist. He's on the fourth floor. Please come up. Let him see you without waiting in line. I'll write up a referral. I'll write up a referral. Okay. Adriana took the elevator to the fourth floor. There were two patients sitting at the urologist's door. Adriana felt uncomfortable walking in front of them. But the gynecologist insisted, so she decided to ask to go ahead. But she saw that the woman also had bellies, so she decided to sit and wait her turn. Next, the door to the office fell open, and a nurse looked out. Come in. What do you have? Here, gynecologist sent tests bad. Show me your tests. It's really not a happy picture. Anything else bothering you? Sometimes my back hurts. Will you have to be hospitalized? Here's a referral. Go tomorrow. You can't delay. It could affect the baby's health. I understand. Now I'll take the card to the gynecologist. Have a good day. Call the next patient, please. I will. Adriana walked out of the office as if she'd been drowned in water. Yes, her lower abdomen tightened and her back ached occasionally. But there were no other symptoms. And then you get a bad test and a hospitalization. She gave her card to the gynecologist, picked up her exchange card, and went home. Michael was home when she got there. They told me to go to the hospital. Dear Hugo, 
something serious. Yes, a bad urine sample. They said it's urgent or it'll hurt the baby. It's necessary. It's necessary. I can handle it. Don't worry. If you need anything, you call me. You'll take a cab tomorrow. No buses. I get it. I'm upset. Adriana wanted to go through the whole pregnancy without hospitals, but it didn't work out. I'm just gonna have to deal with it. She didn't eat breakfast this morning, just drank some water. What if the hospital wanted to take a test on an empty stomach? Things were packed in a bag. All that was left was to get dressed and trained. And being afraid helped Michael. Adriana had a hard time bending over. A cab was waiting near the entrance. Michael carried the bag and helped Adriana into the car. He himself was dressed and went with her. He was very concerned about his wife's condition. Adriana looked calm outwardly. They arrived at the maternity hospital quickly. The car pulled right up to the waiting room. Michael got out and took the bag from the driver and helped Adriana out. There were several other women in the waiting room with their husbands. Michael took a seat next to Adriana and put his arm around her shoulders. Michael, I have to go. This woman will come out now and I'll go. I'll wait for you. Cheers, Michael. All right. The previous woman came out. It was Adriana's turn. She came in, put her exchange card, passport and referral on the doctor's desk. The nurse entered all the data into the computer and invited Adriana into the examination room. You can go and change into your robe and slippers. Grab your bag and the nurse will take you to the post. They'll tell you which room you need to go to. Okay, thank you. Adriana went out into the corridor, took slippers and a robe out of her bag, and started to change. She gave her coat, hat and boots to her husband. Michael put everything in bags, but you can all go home. We'll go to the ward now. Okay, call if you need anything, the husband said. I think I have everything, but it will be seen. Let's go. Okay, bye. Michael patted Adriana on the shoulder and waved. The nurse led Adriana to the elevator, and the two of them went up to the second floor. There was a pathology ward filled with pregnant women with all sorts of disabilities. Some had been here for three weeks or longer. Some were already six weeks pregnant. The nurse at the post looked at the documents, wrote everything down in the journal, and said Ward 205 is on the right. Go and settle down. You're on an empty stomach, right? Then you'll take a blood test now and a urine test tomorrow before 700 hours. Here's a jar and a label. Okay. Adriana took her bag and went looking for room 205. She quickly found it and went inside. There was a woman sitting on a bed near the window talking on the phone. Two of the beds were empty and were behind glass beds. Adriana chose the bed closer to the window. There was an iron nightstand beside the bunk. The woman put there all the necessary things, a mug, a spoon, toothpaste, and a toothbrush. She hung the towels on the headboard. The underwear was in a bag. She put it down, away from the wall, and Adriana remembered she had to go give blood. The woman at the window was talking and not paying any attention to her. So Adriana got up and walked out into the hallway. She approached the nurse's station. Say, where do I have to go? To give blood at the end of the corridor, to the left there. Adriana reached the end of the corridor. There was a treatment room on the left. There were about 10 women standing by it. Who is the last one to give blood? Adriana looked questioningly at those present. Aya, a thin woman in a purple robe and pink slippers stood against the wall. I'm right behind you. Then Adriana looked around for a place for her to sit. She saw an empty seat on a bench, went and sat down. The coup was going fast. Finally, she had to go too. The nurse drew blood very quickly, but it hurt her finger badly, and Adriana tried not to think about it. But the pain was bad enough. Adriana pressed the Vietka harder against her finger and wandered to her room. The woman at the window finished speaking, I am Christina, and you are. She was short in stature, dark-haired, and dark in color. Her eyes, 
Her hair was gathered into a neat bundle. I'm Adriana. I wonder who we'll get. I don't know the third one. I've been in bed for two days, and only today they put you in. Let's call each other. It's very formal, Adriana suggested. Come on. Christina smiled and immediately became very beautiful. I have bad tests. The urologist sent me to the hospital, and so did I. I was put on drips for five days yesterday, and today I've already had a drip. You'll probably get one too. We'll see what the doctor says. What time do you usually make your rounds here? Adriana asked. It varies. Sometimes nine o'clock. Sometimes later. You're early. You'll be on your rounds. Before she could say that, the door opened and two nurses came in. One was an attending physician. The other was the head of the department. Well, girls, tell me how you are doing. The attending physician looked at their charts. Everything was fine. They were dripping IVs. Christina was the first to tell me, but I had just been admitted and had recently taken a blood test. Adriana told her short story. I'll get you a cab. Owl the nurse will bring the drip now. You'll have to lie down for about an hour, so go to the bathroom. Okay, how many IVs do you need? At least five. Then you'll get a urine sample, and we'll see you later. The doctors left and closed the door. I'm dizzy from Philin's cab. I can't get up after the IV, complained Christina Adriana. Wow, I'm gonna get dizzy too. You'll see, it doesn't happen to everyone. A nurse entered the room, carrying a tripod with an IV hanging from it. She told Adriana to lie down and inserted the catheter into her arm and adjusted the speed on it, and off she went. Will you call me when it's done? Okay, I'll get it for you right away, she said to Christina. She went out and came back about 10 minutes later. Christina already had the catheter in her hand with the same IV reading, so the nurse quickly attached the system and walked out. Christina pulled out a thick book and began to read. Can I give you a book? Yes, if I may. I didn't realize I had to get one. What should I read? Here you go. Christina threw the same book on Adriana's bed. And this detective, at least you'll be able to read books. While lying down, Christina smiled at Adriana. That's right. At home, I cannot get to read. It's late. I come home from work while I'm cleaning, cooking, and going to bed. When I went on maternity leave, I thought I would read so I am always cooking, cleaning, going to the clinic, going to buy things for the baby. I've already bought a whole bag. Adriana was happy, smiling. Who's having a boy? Christina asked. Yes, a boy. The doctor at the ultrasound said he got a good look. That's great. I'm having a girl. I have two older sons, but that means there will be a favorite princess. My two older brothers are gonna be the protectors. And it's gonna be daddy's favorite. Someone I know has two boys. And a girl was born. He's blowing the dust off her. I want my husband to want a girl, so he'll get one. Christina smiled broadly. Soon a nurse came in and removed the IVs. Both women breathed a sigh of relief. In 15 minutes, the canteen will be open. Let's go and get in line. Is there a line for the canteen? Adriana was surprised. Not everyone can fit. Some are eating. Others are waiting. Then, of course, let's go and eat. The first ones. There were already five women outside the canteen. Christina and Adriana got in line and waited for the doors to open. Soon the door to the dining room opened and they got in another line. In front of the window, there was a Raskolnik with beef, mashed potatoes, and compote for lunch. Everyone had mugs and they poured their own compote from the kettle. It was Christina and Adriana's turn. They took their plates and took two seats at a table. Two other women joined them. It was strange for Adriana to see so many women in robes at the same time, but gradually she got used to it. Everyone had bellies. Some were fasting and holding their backs. They ate, poured compote into mugs and went to the ward. Look, they're discharging someone. Come here. Christina was looking out the window with her elbows on the sill. 
Adriana came and stood next to her. Indeed, there was a car decorated with balloons downstairs. On it in big letters it said, We have a boy. A woman and a man were fussing around it. They were fixing balloons, adding ribbons. I wondered who would walk in with the baby. A young dark-haired woman in a long black down jacket came out. She carried an envelope with an infant in it. A young dark-haired man walked next to her. He opened the car door and the young mother got in. Other women sat down beside her. The car started slowly and soon pulled into the gate. But here comes another young mommy taking up her duties. That's so sweet. My husband greeted me ceremoniously too, with my two older ones. And with my daughter, I'm afraid to imagine what will happen. That's great. He's so thoughtful. How does he manage at home with two? My mom helps him. So it's not so hard. She takes the younger one to kindergarten and picks him up. The older one goes to school on his own. My husband just helps him get ready. I see. I have my first. I don't know how I'll manage. It's scary how you'll handle it. While he's in the belly rest. Christina smiled and looked at Adriana. When's your due date? Late March 26th, I think. I'm due in early February. I'm in the last few weeks. The doctor's overreacting and decided to put me in the hospital. Yeah, they're taking the responsibility off themselves and putting it on the hospital doctors. Why is the pregnant woman under observation? What about tests? All the IVs. What's wrong with that? It's good. And less headaches. Less people coming in for appointments. That's right. At least two less. Adriana laughed. You and me in the hospital. The door opened, and a dark-haired woman with prominent eyes entered the room. She was carrying a bag and a package, and was dressed in a robe and slippers. I, Slaga, will now be in the same ward with you. Slaga's belly was not visible, but not all pregnant women do. Maybe it's a small period, and Olga, I'm Adriana. Nice to meet you. I was admitted to the hospital at 12 weeks, and I started poisoning. I don't know what will come of it. The doctors will figure it out. We're having dinner soon. Yeah, that's it. Out of the blue. I went to a doctor's appointment, and she sent me straight to the hospital. A nurse came in and gave Clara a referral for blood and handed out urine collection jars. Girls, please collect urine by 6 o'clock tomorrow. Remember what I said about hygiene? We do. Clara put things in the nightstand. Her hair was long and straight, gathered in a ponytail. Her face had wide cheekbones. She looked like some kind of oriental beauty. They spent their days taking IVs, walking the corridors of the hospital. A week later, Christina went into labor in the morning. A nurse came in, took Christina for a checkup, told her to pack her things, and move to the labor room. Well, girls, goodbye. Olechka, have a nice labor. Thank you, darlings. I'll write as soon as I can. But we'll be waiting. Christina left and Adriano was left alone with Clara. After three o'clock a message came from Christina that a girl was born, weighing three kilograms, 250 grams, and 51 centimeters tall. Right congratulations from us. Slaga was very happy. It will be great, my daughter. She has two sons. Wow, now there will be three children. The girl will be carried in your arms. Yes. And you, Clara, you have other children. Yes, I have a son. He's 14 years old. I wanted to have another child, but probably not fate. We have a genetic disease on the female side of the family. I'm afraid that if we have a girl, we'll pass it on to her. I don't think about it. What if it's a boy? That's my only hope but this is my fifth pregnancy. I can't bear it. It took a long time to carry my son too. He was a good boy. Maybe they'll keep this one too. One morning, Clara started bleeding. She was taken on a stretcher to the operating room, and then the nurse took her things and brought them to the room on the sixth floor where she was lying after the operation. She lost the baby, outflow, pregnancy. Christina voted two weeks. Slaga was very fond of reading. She brought five books with her. They took turns reading them, 
The books were about love and detectives. The time in the hospital flew by. Michael had managed to go on two long business trips. Christina was replaced by a small, thin woman with a big belly. Hello, I'm Cindy. This is my bed. Yes, I'm Adriana. And I'm Cindy. Nice to meet you. I worked as a pediatrician at the clinic before my maternity, and I'm in accounting. Adriana remembered her reports and folders. You didn't want to let me go. And I'm in extra departmental security. Clara looked very serious. Indeed, she was perfect for the role of security guard. They let me go. I had no choice. The ambulance took me away. The women flooded Cindy with questions about childcare and feeding the children their illnesses. Cindy was very outgoing and was happy to answer questions thoroughly. Adriana and Cindy had about the same due date and were discharged almost on the same day. Adriana came home, unpacked and began to prepare for the arrival of the baby. The due date was exactly one month away. One morning Michael was going to the office to take the signed documents and attend a meeting. Adriana sent another batch of the baby's clothes to the laundry. Suddenly the contractions started. They were getting more and more frequent. Michael, I'm going into labor. We have to go to the maternity hospital so suddenly. Wait, I'll call the office to say I'll be there later. Let me help you. He helped Adriana change her clothes. And the boots. The bags were already folded. One contained Adriana's things, and the other had diapers and diapers and wet wipes and diaper cream for the baby. The cab came quickly. The two of them went downstairs, and Adriana struggled to drop off the road to the maternity hospital. Michael took her to the door of the emergency room, helped her remove her clothes and change into a robe and slippers. All the outerwear and shoes he had taken home again. Like last time there was a closet here, but it was always full and finding things was a problem. The doctor looked at Adriana's paperwork, filled out all the information in the computer again, then invited her into the exam room and then into the enemas. Michael at this time was already on his way to the office in a cab. He was confident that Adriana would be helped. The labor had lasted all day and Adriana was exhausted. The baby had turned and there was no way it wanted to turn around. That's right, her water broke. The decision was made to do an emergency C-section. Adriana lay on a stretcher and was wheeled into the operating room and in time for a blood test. And while the doctors were preparing, he was ready. It was possible to proceed to the operation. The anesthesiologist came, prepared everything for anesthesia and sat down. A special anesthesia was injected nearby and Adriana stopped feeling the whole lower part of her body. The doctors covered her stomach and legs with a curtain. They took out the baby. They lifted him up high and showed him to Adriana. Her head was a blur, and Adriana's vision of her son was blurry. He screamed he was taken away to be measured and weighed for examination. The boy is 3 kilograms, 540 milligrams, 53 centimeters, a rich man. The stitch was sewn up, and the gurney with Adriana was taken to the ICU where four other women lay besides her. All of them were covered with blankets after the scissorian, as they were chilled after the anesthesia. Adriana stayed in the ward until six o'clock, and the nurse took her to her room. Her things were already standing by the bedside table. Adriana struggled to get from the gurney to the bed. Her stomach began to ache. A nurse came in and injected painkillers. It got easier. Adriana tried to sleep. There was no one else in the room except her. Two hours later, another woman was brought in. She was also post-operative. The woman was very pale. Her long hair was dislodged from under her cap and spread out on the pillow. She was lying with her eyes closed. The nurse also injected her with medicine. In the neighboring wards, two lay women after surgery. The whole ward was post-op. Some had already brought babies. Adriana was looking forward to this moment with anticipation and horror at the same time. She could hardly sit up on the bed. Her stomach ached and the catheter was still in place. The tube from it was in the way. It was scary to snag it. A nurse came in. Girls, now I will take this beauty off because it is really hard for you to walk. 
She cleverly freed both of them from the catheter, and the woman sighed with relief. Now I'm gonna take you one by one to the shower. Take a towel and clean underwear. With those words, she stepped out. My name is Anya. I had a baby girl. They said they'll deliver today. I'm Adriana. I have a boy. They haven't told me anything yet. Maybe they'll deliver today too, but we'll wait. The doctor came for rounds. Then came the nanny, the ceiling. Anya, your baby is under the lamp and will be brought in tonight. Adriana, your baby is in intensive care. He has a heart condition. Don't worry, you'll be able to see him every day from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Until then, put him in a bottle and carry the baby's milk. You got it? Oh my God, what is this? Adriana cried. She was both scared and bitter that her baby was so small, had not had time to see anything, and was already sick. Adriana, everything will be all right. You'll see. We have excellent pediatric cardiologists. They do surgeries of any complexity. They'll do the same for your baby. And he'll live happily ever after with his mommy and, and daddy. Yeah, I guess it's best to hope and believe in the best outcome. I can't let the baby suffer. Adriana wiped her tears and wrote Michael a message. My son was born, but he has a heart condition. They're keeping him in the IQ. I don't know anything yet. I'll go and see him tomorrow. Michael came in 200 hours later, brought some things for Adriana. I was upset at first, but then I thought what happens to the baby if the parents can't pull themselves together. We have to be strong for him. You hear me? We'll do whatever the doctors say and save him. Yeah, I'm of the same opinion. You can come by tomorrow. We'll go to the ICU together. You know, I'm probably not ready yet. I'm not forcing you. I understand how hard this must be for you. You haven't even held him yet. But I, the mother, carried him under my heart. So we have a stronger bond. We feel each other. I'll be with him as long as it takes, under any circumstances. If I can muster up the courage, I'll be there. But I can't promise. I can definitely make it in a day. Okay. For the rest of the day, evening and night, Adriana contacted every three o'clock and carried the milk to the NICU. The nurses there would take the bottle from her and feed the baby. The child spent 10 days in intensive care. After that time, he and Adriana were transferred to the second stage of nursing in another hospital. There Adriana was able to take him in her arms and take care of him. The baby was injected with different drugs, taken to ultrasounds and different procedures. Adriana was there for him. After three weeks in the hospital, a doctor came to her room and told her it was time for surgery. I've contacted the pediatric cardiology department. They're ready for you in three days. Why don't you get your stuff together and I'll get the paperwork ready. Okay, what kind of surgery? They're gonna do a valve replacement. They're professionals. A lot of kids with different pathologies go through them. I've heard from a lot of parents that they can handle even the most advanced cases. Thank you very much. I'll write the rights to my husband now. All the best to you. I'm gonna go get your baby's paperwork ready. Michael and Adriana named their son Robert. It was a name they both liked very much. Robert. Adriana envisioned her son as a grown-up solid man. But first, daycare school. Adriana smiled to herself. Everything will be fine. She was sure of that. Adriana called Michael. Michael, we've been accepted for surgery. There's an opening in the hospital in three days. We're being discharged. If you're coming, please pick up the extra stuff. That's very good news. I have faith that Robert will be helped. They said they're going to enlarge the valve. I don't know how. I'm hoping to find out from the heart surgeon. He should be able to tell us at least briefly. Yeah, I think he will. I'll be there tonight. So get a bag of stuff ready to pick up. Adriana gave birth to Robert and put him in his crib. She went through her things and put the things she wouldn't need in a separate bag for Michael to pick up. There would be too much stuff at the discharge. Robert looked like any other infant, except that he often had vinyl around his lips. He wouldn't take the breast. 
there was no strength. Adriana would bond and feed him from a bottle. Michael bought her an electric breast milk. It made the mother's milk contract faster. Robert ate well and with appetite gradually gained weight. The day of the discharge came. Michael waited for them downstairs, took Adriana's son, and looked at his face for a long time. You know, it's like looking in a mirror, and there's me and not me. He looks a lot like you. Let's get in the car. I'm sick to death of these hospitals. Yeah, let's go. The cab's waiting. You carry it, Sonny, and I'll take the bags. After saying goodbye to the doctor and the nursing staff, Adriana left the room with Robert in her arms. Robert was in a warm fur envelope. He was sleeping sweetly. In the cab, they put him in a special restraint seat and strapped him in. Michael had bought the car seat in advance, and it waited for almost two months. We arrived at the cardiology hospital. In the emergency room, Adriana gave the documents to Robert, herself held him in her arms to undress the baby. The pediatrician filled out the card. After me, you'll go next door to the cardiologist's office. He will do a cardiogram and listen to your heart. Adriana obediently undressed Robert and put him on the table. The doctor examined and listened to the baby well from all sides. Now you can dress him and go to the cardiologist. Adriana carefully dressed her son and held him close to her. She went out into the corridor and saw a door labeled cardiologist. She went in, put the baby on the couch. The cardiologist had the CT machine ready. The cardiologist put sensors on Robert's body and recorded an EKG. Not a good cardiogram. We need an emergency surgery. Go up to the third floor. They'll tell you what room you're in and they'll come in and run the necessary tests for the surgery. Okay, doctor, thank you. Adriana quickly dressed the baby and went out. She took her bag and went to the elevator. The elevator came quickly and opened the doors in front of her. On the third floor, they were quickly processed and led Adriana to a room. The room had a crib and an adult bed. There were no other beds in the room. There was also a closet so that clothes and shoes could be left here rather than taken home. A nurse came in and took Robert's blood test. The baby wrinkled his nose and whimpered unhappily. The cardiologist came in an hour later. The surgery is scheduled for tomorrow. It is necessary to be on an empty stomach. In the morning, a nurse will come in and get Robert. She will take him to the operating room. The surgery will last three hours. You can rest during that time and go outside. Do you hear that? Do you need this? You need to be aware because the baby will need your help. With these words, she walked out and closed the door behind her. Adriana cried again, already out of fear for the baby. What if he died? She did not want to live. Let them take her heart and give it to Robert. Would she agree to die? No, it's worse when children are sick. It seemed that anything would be given to keep them healthy and cheerful. In the morning, Adriana dressed Robert in the washcloth the nurse had brought. Robert looked very touchy and whimpered with hunger. Adriana photographed this moment in her son's life. She would later look at this photograph many times. Here, her baby's body would still be without scars and incisions. A nurse came into the room to wrap him quickly in a blanket. The surgeons are now ready. Adriana wrapped Robert in the blanket and handed the envelope to the nurse. She walked out and closed the door behind her. Adriana couldn't find a place to be. She decided to get dressed and go for a walk outside. She quickly got dressed and put on her shoes, putting booties on her shoes, and walked down to the exit to the street. It was freezing cold. Adriana put on and buttoned up her blue down jacket, pulled the hood over her head, and walked out of the hospital doors. There were several stores and a long street near the hospital. Adriana simply walked forward, not paying attention to anything. The brisk walking calmed her down. She walked and walked at a brisk pace. Suddenly, her gaze was caught by the window of a children's store. There were some cute toys on display. She opened the door and found herself inside a large room. There were racks of toys everywhere. Adriana picked up different things until she stopped on a rustling and shiny lion. 
It was sewn from fabrics of different textures, and the paw had rings with different spikes to develop fine motor skills. She put the lion in the basket. A brightly colored rattle in the shape of a butterfly also caught her attention. She took that too. She also put a pack of diapers, a pack of wipes and diapers, and baby soap. Satisfied with her purchases, Adriana left the store. It was snowing. She admired the falling snowflakes. Suddenly, she realized that she and her son were going to be fine. Now they would bring him back from surgery. She would take good care of him, and he would recover quickly. She came into the room, quickly stripped off her soap and rattle, and wiped the lion with a damp washcloth. A nurse came in and said surgery is over. He's in intensive care for now. It's routine. The little guy's gonna be there for 500 hours. You can come to the NICU cube now. Feed him. Pack up. I'll take you. Okay, I'll get a bottle and some milk. Why? Try breastfeeding. He's not that weak while he's asleep, but he's about to wake up. They walked down a long hallway, then took the elevator and walked down the long hallway again to the very end. The ICU door opened with a running lock. Adriana stepped inside and saw various flashing colored machines with wires running from them to the children lying on high medical beds with handrails. She walked over to the bed where Robert was lying. He seemed so small compared to the size of the bed. There were several wires stretching into his calf, sensors beeping, instruments running. Adriana felt it roll up to her throat. She restrained herself and lay down next to her son. He was sniffling sweetly and was very sweet and touching. Soon he woke up and without opening his eyes he wanted to eat. Adriana gave him the prepared bottle with formula. She did not have much milk. The pediatrician allowed pre-feeding with formula. It was not very convenient in the IQ, but Adriana managed. Robert was full and fell asleep again. Adriana really wanted to protect him. She didn't notice that she had fallen asleep. The nurse touched Adriana's shoulder. Get up. You can carry him to his room. The cardiologist will be here soon for a checkup. Adriana got up and wrapped Robert in the blankets, held him close to her, and felt a rush of tenderness and sadness at the same time. Tears were pouring from her eyes. They came into the room. Adriana put Robert in the blanket, right in the crib. She sat down next to him and rested her head on the side of the bed. She stared at her son, unable to look away. The cardiologist came in. The surgery was a success, he said. It's healing now. You will spend another two to three weeks in the hospital, depending on how it goes. You should pay attention to things like fever, refusal to eat, bluing of the lips. In these cases, call a nurse immediately. Do you understand? I got it. It was the same old routine. Robert was taken for procedures and exams, and fed and dressed before bedtime. Adriana would take Robert in her arms and walk him back and forth down the long hallway. That way she felt better and Robert was not as bored. On the walls in the hallway were many children's drawings and illustrations of fairy tales. Adriana would stop and show them to her son, and he would look at them curiously. After three weeks they were discharged home. They were told to take care of the infection and not to give him a lot of exercise. Michael loved his son very much, carried him in his arms, took him for rides on the big car and pampered him. Robert laughed heartily. Three years passed, and it was time for Adriana to go to work. She could have stayed on, but she was desperately short of money. Medicines for Robert were very expensive. At work Adriana was welcomed with pleasure, and there was still a lot of work to do. Adriana quickly got in shape after giving birth and went to the gym and swimming pool. Michael was babysitting his son at this time. He realized that Michael needed to reboot, and physical activity is the best way to do it. Robert was growing up and would soon require a new surgery. Unfortunately, the pediatric surgeon who operated on them was away in another country for training. He was the only one who could perform this level of surgery. Adriana sat at the appointment with the cardiologist and grimaced. Look for a clinic that will operate on you. Understand, you don't have much time without this surgery. Robert's condition may suddenly worsen, 
and then even lethal outcome is not excluded. I see many cases like this. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do yet. Surgeons of this caliber are worth their weight in gold, unfortunately. The cardiologist smiled wryly and continued filling out the paperwork. Adriana and Michael turned over a ton of information and found a clinic in Israel. They emailed them Robert's paperwork. Three days later, they heard back from the clinic that they were ready to take them and that the cost of the surgery would be $50,000. They sat stunned. They didn't have that kind of money. Even if they sold their apartment, it still wouldn't be enough. They could only get half the amount, take out a loan. But there's a way out, isn't there? I'll go to the chief. I know there's a lot of money in the company. Of course, the chief can refuse me, but he won't punch me in the nose for asking. Try it. I'll ask my boss tomorrow. Why don't we open a fundraiser? There are special funds we should try that too. You and I should do the possible and the impossible. Yes, Adriana, I'll go call my boss and I'll find the fund and talk to the chief too. In the morning, Adriana went into the chief's office. Kevin, there's trouble, Adriana. Something's wrong with my son. He needs emergency surgery. We don't do that here. We've requested various clinics. Only Israel will take us, but they ask for $50,000. I don't know where I can get that much money. We'll find half of it through relatives and friends. We'll sell my parents' summer house. But another 25000 I don't know where to get. That's a lot of money, Adriana. Of course, the company could help you. But now, we have used all the money to buy new equipment and took an additional loan from the bank. We want to install a production line. Sawing. What should we do? I'll think about it and tell you today. I have some ideas. Go to work. Adriana went to work, but she couldn't work. All her thoughts revolved around money. Where to get it, how to pay it back. In the evening, the chief called Adriana to her room. I've been thinking about it, and I'd like to make a suggestion. We can get funding for a new project now. It will be a new workshop to be a significant figure in the eyes of the partners. I have to be a good family man. And what's my role in that? Adriana asked. I know you're married. We'll have to divorce for a while. We'll get married. I ask you to be my companion for two years. You'll earn the money you need, and you won't have to give it back. You don't have to leave your husband. I won't demand sex from you. But I don't have time to look for someone for a long time. And you're a smart and savvy woman. And you have a child, which is a plus. All you will need to do is to appear with me at events, do photo shoots, travel with me on business trips, I can teach you a lot of things. You give me an image, and I'll give you money. It's a very unexpected offer. I'll have to discuss it with my husband. Of course, I won't force you to do anything. Just don't discuss it too long. We'll need your help soon. The child will be examined by the best doctors. I'll think about it, Adriana replied. Have a good day. I'll expect your answer tomorrow. Adriana felt like she'd been hit over the head with a shoe. How was it possible to divorce Michael? But the thought of money for the operation overshadowed everything. Robert can be saved. We need to talk to Michael. He's smart. He'll understand. That evening, she waited with a shudder to talk to her husband. Robert was playing quietly on the floor with a construction set. What if he was running out? Her lips set up sharply. Jesus, Robert, what's wrong with you? Mom, I feel sick. Hold on, son, I'll call soon. She dialed the ambulance number, recognizing what was wrong. The operator at the ambulance station promised an ambulance would arrive as soon as possible. Adriana dressed herself, gathered Robert's things, dressed him. The doorbell rang. It was the EMTs. They did a quick electrocardiogram. You need to be hospitalized immediately. We're all packed. Yeah, we're ready. Then let's go. Adriana and Robert left the house and got into the ambulance. The ambulance took them to a familiar cardiac hospital. In the waiting room sat their doctor. When he saw Robert, he turned pale. What's wrong? He coughed, and his lips were ringing. The paramedics did an electrocardiogram 
and said it was bad. I told you, there's hardly any time. I'll call my colleagues and we'll see what we can do. Thank you. Adriana couldn't cry. She was tense and her head was like a fog. A nurse came and took Robert away. You can go up to the room with him. Just put on shoe covers. Colleagues will be here in a moment. Thank you. They went up to the fourth floor to the pediatric ward. There were doctors waiting for them. One of them took Robert's hand and said, Do you want to see how your heart works on TV? I do. Let's go then. And your mom will wait for us here. They're off to do an ultrasound on the heart. The valve lumen's getting bigger. It's still closing periodically. But time is running out. You said an Israeli clinic was taking you. Yes, they've agreed to take us as soon as possible. We have already collected half of the amount, and we can go halfway. They've agreed to take us at the end of rehab. Do you have where to get the other half? Asked the doctor. My husband and I are actively pursuing this issue. Okay, we are in the process of replicating this seizure, but you just have to go to surgery right away. Michael called. Where are you? Robert's taken a turn for the worse, Adriana answered. We're at the hospital. The doctor said that the operation is necessary soon. The chief promised me a $10,000 loan. That's good news. Michael, can you come to the hospital? I need to have a serious talk with you. Yeah, I'll be there in half an hour. I'll call you when I'm in the lobby. Okay, I'm waiting. Half an hour later, Michael and Adriana were sitting in the lobby. Michael, I'm going to tell you something. I won't interrupt you. I managed to find some money at my place of business. The chief has agreed to give it to me. But there's one tricky condition. What's that? You have to sleep with him. That would be too easy. No, he wants me to pose as his wife and his family. Two years without a bed. I mean, traveling with him, taking pictures everywhere, attending important events. And in return, he's promised to give me the money I need. And that was it. No, that's not it. You and I need a divorce. A divorce. I have to be his legal wife. You realize the press will dig, and what they find has to be legal. What about me? We'll remain husband and wife, and after two years we'll be living together again. Michael. He's got a good idea. Michael resented getting a ready-made beautiful wife and son. Michael Robert needs surgery now, and I will do everything possible to save him. And you? Me too, but not at the same cost. What price? How about you sell your kidney? What's your way out? The 10,000 the chief will give you won't be enough for the surgery. I'll go to work with you tomorrow, and we'll talk about it. I am jealous, but at the same time I love Robert very much, and would do anything for him. Good, Adriana replied. Tomorrow I'll invite the chief to the hospital. They won't let us out, we'll agree on a certain time and you'll come. It's a deal. Now I'm going home. I'm shocked by this news. I need to recover. Make the right decision, please. I'll do my best. Michael left and Adriana waited for Robert after the procedure. He was brought in an hour later and put on an IV. Adriana sat next to him and held his hand. She stroked it, stroking her son's forehead and, and cheeks. He lay pale. There was a blueness near his lips, but gradually the blush returned. The telephone bell rang. It was the chief calling. Adriana, I'm sorry to bother you. Can you talk? Yes, I can. We're at the hospital, and the slide's gotten worse. He needs emergency surgery. I've tentatively agreed to your offer. My husband's coming tomorrow, and he wants to talk to you. Why don't I come to the hospital where he's been sitting for hours? Let him come too, replied the chief. The lawyer has prepared a contract so that you have no doubt that you will get your money. The next day, Adriana, Michael and Kevin met in the hotel lobby. Michael had been thinking all night and had a right decision. Kevin, I agree to let my wife go to serve you. This was not easy for me to accept. After all, I am her husband and I love her. After all, I thought, she's going into the army for two years. I'll wait for her. I love my son very much and I'm ready to accept different offers. 
Here's the contract. The lawyers have it all worked out. Your wife is appointed to the position of my personal assistant with the appropriate salary for a period of two years. For the two years, she is to literally shadow me. You will see each other at my home. There will be a separate room for you, but it won't be a lot of video conferencing during those two years. That's as much as you want. When Robert was discharged, Adriana went to work in her new position. All the employees were dying of envy, and they couldn't understand what the chief found in her. Michael went with Robert to Israel. The operation was successful. The boy was saved. After two years of forced separation, the couple was reunited again. The chief got the contract he had long dreamed of. He built two new workshops and started a new production facility.